for them, and then he elaborates on that prayer uh, in light of Christ's exaltation. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he speaks of God's power that was directed toward them and the grace of salvation. Chapter 2, 11 to 22, we spent a lot of time on that last week. In, in 2, 11 to 22, Paul calls him to remember God's saving work from the sp- specific perspective of their past as Gentiles. He wants them to recall that so they will have greater appreciation of, of the condition from which they've been rescued in Christ. He reminds them that they were in a dire state of alienation prior to their conversion. But Christ, he unified Jews and Gentiles into one body through the setting aside of the Mosaic law. And he not only created that one new body, having resolved these hostilities, these horizontal hostilities, he creates this one new body and he reconciles that body with God by atoning for the sins that had separated both Jews and Gentiles from him. So these Gentiles, who once were outsiders, they're now insiders. Okay, they're fellow participants in the kingdom of God, and in more intimate terms, they're members of the of the of God's household, family members. And we have to get what that you know what that means to speak of children of God, members of His family. Then he describes this unification of Jews and Gentiles as they're being fit together into a building. This unified structure that is this building we're being added to and fit to. We're growing as a holy temple into a completed holy temple. Okay, so that's 2.11 to 22. Then in chapter 3, verse 1, he he begins a prayer report in in light of what he's just said in 2.11 to 22. In light of these tremendous blessings that they have, focusing specifically on their Gentile past, he begins to tell them his prayer And then he quickly digresses and he doesn't pick back up with his prayer report until chapter 3, verse 14. And in chapter 3, verses 2 through 7, he tells him that he's been entrusted with a commission to proclaim God's grace to the Gentiles in the gospel. God has given him this commission and God had revealed to the apostles and prophets the mystery of his intention to bless the Gentiles with the Jews. He, He let them know This mystery, how he would do that. He reveals this mystery that he would bless the Gentiles with the Jews. He would do that not through the Gentiles joining the Jews as faithful adherents of the Mosaic law, but rather he would bring them together in one body, this unified body that was not bound by the Mosaic law. So he tells them that in in 3, 2 through 7. And then we were looking at 3, 8 through 13 when we stopped last week, and I'll read that again. And ah. I wanted to tell you here, I have at the website, I put up the notes for the first three chapters. So if you want like the quotes I have and all that, I have posted those now. So I forget, it's like 30 pages, three different sections. Uh, There you have it. Chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. Paul says, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the good news of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone as to what is the plan of the mystery that for ages was hidden in God who created all things, in order that the richly diverse wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms through the church. This was according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I ask you, therefore, not to be disheartened by my sufferings on your behalf, which is your glory. Okay, Paul here, uh, in, in 3, 8 through 13, he says, look, despite the fact that I violently persecuted the church, okay, where he says, the very least of all the saints, despite that fact, he was given this glorious assignment of preaching to the Gentiles, and in effect, he's preaching the gospel to them, and effect of which, as he preaches this gospel, is that Gentiles are coming into this one body with Jews. You see this reconciling effect that is taking place as Paul preaches the Gentiles, the Gentiles accept it, and they therefore become this one body with Jewish believers that he's been talking about. And the effect of that is then to enlighten all people regarding the nature of God's previously unrevealed mystery. Okay, that mystery is is that he is creating one body from these previously hostile groups, and it's about the manner in which he's doing that. 
Okay, he is not doing that by having, he's not blessing Gentiles with Jews by having Jews come in and be faithful adherents of the Mosaic law. He's doing something new. He's doing something different. He's creating this new body. So as Paul preaches the gospel to Gentiles, as they accept it, they then come into this one body, and that fact then enlightens all people as to the nature of this previously unrevealed mystery. And the purpose of that, you see in verse 10, the purpose of that, he says, of this bringing Gentiles and Jews into one body and of its consequence in, consequent enlightening of all people, he says in verse 10, in order that the richly diverse wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms through the church. Now, I just got to this when we ended last week, but I want you to, to absorb this. Okay, absorb this. The purpose was that the richly diverse wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms through the church. God discloses his complex, his multifaceted. I always think of like one of those roaring 20s balls with all the facets on it. See, his complex, his multifaceted wisdom, he discloses that wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms through the very existence of this unified, multiracial, multiethnic community that is the church. You see, he has brought Jews and Gentiles, all other hostile factions, he has brought them together in one. So the very existence of this healed community, the very existence of this group, this multiracial, multiethnic group brought together as one, one body, the very existence of this group is a message to the heavenly beings. Okay, to angels and especially to demons. It is a token, okay, it is a, to the church is an object lesson. To the heavenly beings, angels, even the demons, it's a foretaste or a token, you see, of the coming cosmic reconciliation that he mentioned in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. This unification, this reconciled body of people is a token of what he's doing in Christ. Right? He, what is he doing? He's healing. He's resolving. Cosmic reconciliation is coming because of Jesus Christ where all things will function in harmony. And so this church that exists today in the here and now is a token of that. It is a token of that cosmic reconciliation that's now in process. It is a sign of the already won victory and thus it's a display of God's supreme wisdom in the achievement in Christ of his purposes in reversing the fall. What happened with the fall? The fall created disintegration and curse and everything apart and everything separated. Well, in Christ, he's reuniting everything. He's bringing all things together and the church is a token of that victory that proclaims that. So it proclaims his wisdom in reversing the consequences of the fall in Jesus Christ to the heavenly beings. I love this stuff. You know, this is like, look at what the church is. And when people talk about I don't care about the church. I just want to get a gun. <laughs> what do you mean you don't care about the church? Do you know what the church is? Do you understand what the church is? Do you understand what the church is saying? Not only to people around, but to the heavenly beings. As we are one body in Jesus Christ. And implicit in this is the fact that the demonic powers have been defeated, which is a real comfort, see, given the spiritual warfare that they are fighting and that we are fighting. It is a comfort to know that this victory has been won and is simply working itself out. Now, the church's role in God's revealing of his wisdom to heavenly beings was part of his eternal purpose. Okay, not an afterthought, not a sidelight. It's a purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ. In their union with Christ through faith in him, they and we, all Christians, have the privilege, he says, of confident access to God. In verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Okay, we cannot be blocked from God by any spiritual forces of evil. You see, this is more, more in their thinking, but still a reality, but more in their thinking, more of a blessing for them to hear this, that there's no power that is going to trump our access to God. We're saying, 
Yes, I'm in Christ. And I want to have this relationship with God. I want to be close with God. And then here comes some power that comes in and intervenes and blocks and says, no, you need to dance to my tune if you want that. And I think this is what happened in Colossae, where they, they were kowtowing to other forces and powers. Somebody had convinced them that starting with Christ is okay, but if you want fullness with God, if you want all that God offers mankind, well, then you better appease or placate these heavenly forces. You better satisfy them and dance to their tune. Well, that's nonsense. Okay, and, I, and he's saying Ephesians and Colossians have a lot of similarity, and he's letting them know there is no power that intervenes and blocks your relationship with God in Jesus Christ, and that's an important thing for us to understand. And in light of the glory of the ministry that God had graciously given to him, Paul ends this paragraph with verse 13. He says, I ask you, therefore, not to be disheartened by my sufferings on your behalf. See, he doesn't want them to be disheartened. It's an honor to suffer in service of such a grand and glorious cause. That's how Paul saw it. Paul is suffering, and he says, don't be disheartened by that. Look, Paul says, I was given this task it was a great thing. God in His grace allowed me to play this role. So don't be disheartened by my sufferings. It's a privilege. It's an honor to suffer for such a glorious cause. So don't be disheartened by the fact that I'm suffering. Don't let that happen. Moreover, His imprisonment was, was their glory in the sense that He was there for refusing to compromise the truth that Jews and Gentiles were together as one body. That's what got him in the slammer. That's what got him in trouble. All over he was chased by people who were saying, no, 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 don't listen to that stuff. Don't listen to what Paul is saying. You better obey the law of Moses. You better be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. So Paul says, look, this is your glory. That my imprisonment, I am, I am imprisoned for telling you the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ and for letting it be known that Jews and Gentiles are one body in Jesus Christ. Okay, chapter 3, verse 14, just 14 through 19. He says, for this reason, now he picks back up the prayer report that he started. Then we had that digression, which doesn't mean digression is not a slight. It doesn't mean it's unimportant. It just means in his flow of thought, he was saying something, and he said, oh, let me tell you this first. Okay, and then he picks back up, and he says, for this reason, I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, in order that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, having been rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now, Paul, as I say, he picks back up his prayer report. And when he says, for this reason, it relates back to God's gracious work on their behalf that he had recounted in chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. All that he had reported there, what God has done, how God has blessed them and how he's blessed us. And he says, for this reason, and he, so he connects back with that. And then the fact that he kneels before God is obviously a sign of great reverence and submission. Okay, he's kneeling before him, and he calls him the Father, which in the ancient world, it wasn't only a, a term of intimacy, but it was one that had overtones of dignity and authority. The Father, he was the protector and all that, but he also was the ruler of the household. And so you see all of these things tied up when he refers to God as the Father. Now, God is the Father from whom every family, he says, in heaven and on earth is named because he's the creator of all things. Okay, he is the source of every order or class of heavenly beings, so you can think of family that way. He's the source of every order or class of heavenly beings, and he's the ultimate ancestor of every family of humans. Okay, God is the creator of all things. They all carry his name in the general sense that they are all creatures of God. Okay, and this is one of these things that just makes our culture just go crazy. This idea of God is the creator. And, you know, they push nonstop this stuff that, no, he's not. There is no creator. You came from nowhere out of nothing by chance. Okay? And that's just, that's taught everywhere. You, you breathe it in. 
And if you say that that's insane, they say that you're a religious fanatic or something like that. But anyway, creator. Okay, God is the creator. Uh, all of these, the heavenly beings, all human beings, okay, he's ultimately the creator. Paul prays that God, according to his limitless resources, will strengthen them with power in the inner person through his spirit. Or as he puts it differently. Now, the way I read these clauses like O'Brien and some other people, I think he's restating in the next clause what he means when he says that he'll strengthen him with power in any person, inner person through the Spirit. He then puts it differently in the next clause, but saying the same idea that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Okay, strengthen in the inner person through the Spirit, that is that Christ may dwell in their hearts through, through faith. Now the Spirit's transforming empowerment of the inner person is Christ, through the Spirit. Okay, you see that, that that's not an odd idea of Christ through the Spirit. You can see it in Romans 8, 9, and 10, Galatians 2, 20, Galatians 4, 6. So this Spirit's transforming empowerment of their inner person is Christ through the Spirit, pervading their hearts, extending His occupancy, so to speak. Okay, pervading their hearts, extending His occupancy of their inner being. It is Christ who indwells from salvation, making himself at home, becoming deeply rooted in their lives, becoming the controlling factor in their attitudes and conduct, spreading out in their hearts, being transformed that way. Christ extending his occupancy, so to speak. Okay, this is the idea of what he's praying for in their lives. As O'Brien remarks, he says, his indwelling is not something additional to the strengthening. To be empowered by the Spirit in the inner person means that Christ himself dwells in their hearts. It is this extension of control and power in their lives that he's praying for. And this indwelling for which he prays is through faith. Okay, it is through faith. In the sense that it means it happens in conjunction with their trust in Christ. Okay, this happens in conjunction with their trust in Christ. It's through, the, it's through ongoing faith that we yield to rather than resist Christ's transforming influence. His making himself at home. You know Christians who fight that. Then they say, what's, what's wrong? And you know Christians who yield to the Spirit's transformation. Okay, so that's what he's talking about when he says that this is through faith and the strengthening with power of their inner man, the indwelling of Christ for which he prays. Now, there's some, this is, you know, how you tie these clauses together can get complicated. I'm telling you how I see it. Okay, there's something of a progression here where you have this strengthening with power of the inner man, this indwelling of Christ for which he's praying, is so that having been rooted and grounded in love as a result of that transforming empowerment. Okay, he wants Christ to, to spread out, the Spirit to transform them, so that you will then have, they'll be rooted and grounded in love as a result, that they may have power with all the saints to comprehend certain things. This is the logic, it seems, of what Paul is saying. And you say, well, how, how does that fit together? Okay, here's what I think he's saying. As one is transformed into the image of Christ, love becomes increasingly central to one's life. Okay, as the Spirit transforms us, as Christ extends his occupancy, love becomes increasingly central to a person's life. And as that happens, one's ability to be blessed with insight expands. Okay, as love becomes more central to my life, as a result of the Spirit's transforming work, my ability to be blessed with insight expands. See, being rooted and grounded in love, it repositions a person. You see, I now will look at something, I'll come over here, because I've been rooted and grounded in love. It repositions a person, so that the person, that he's now better able to receive from God the power to comprehend certain things as never before. Okay? Spirit transforms me. Love becomes central, rooted and grounded in love. I now have this new perspective that I'm now able for God to bless me with comprehension of things that he could not bless me with over here. Okay, so I think that's what's happening, what Paul is praying about. And he prays that they may have power with all the saints. Now, what's he saying there? He wants them to be repositioned that God may give them comprehension of what? 
He says, so that you may have power with all the saints to comprehend the width, length, height, and depth. Okay, now he doesn't specify the object of this length, width, height, and depth. And there's disagreement over to what it refers, but I'm with those who think it refers to the love of Christ. Christ's love for us that he mentions in the very next verse. And in fact, the NIV and the TNIV, they bootleg that clause into this one just to make that understanding clear. And there may be some other translations that do that. So I think that's right, it's just not how the text reads. Okay, so this idea, he, what does he want God to bless them with? What is the comprehension that this repositioned person, through the transforming work of the Spirit, he's praying that they may what? He wants God to give them this heightened, this new comprehension of the length, width, height, and depth of Christ's love. He wants God to enable them to grasp the immensity of Christ's love, and with that, for them to know in a deep and personal sense, the love that is so magnificent, it is beyond knowing fully. Okay, O'Brien remarks on that. He says, to speak of Christ's love as surpassing knowledge means that it's so great that one can never know it fully. No matter how much we know of the love of Christ, how fully we enter into his love for us, there is always more to know and experience. And that's how it is. Christ's love for us is that deep, that mind-boggling, that we cannot exhaust it. But Paul is praying that God will grant them a greater comprehension, and his prayer for their increasing comprehension and knowledge of Christ's love is, is for what? He says, so that... All of this, you see this, transformed in the inner, inner being. Okay, Christ extending his occupancy, so to speak. So love becomes central to a person's uh, character. As that happens, one is repositioned and it is a better position than for God to bless them with knowledge and insight. He wants that knowledge and insight of what? Of the depth, length, width, height, and depth of Christ's love for us. Now, why does he want that? Okay, he's praying for that. He's, he wants that, he says, so that the end, he, he says, uh, increasing comprehension of knowledge in Christ's love, so that they may be filled with all the fullness, in the last clause, verse here, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, what does Paul want for them? D.A. Carson, uh, he says in his book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, he says, to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God is simply a Pauline way of saying to be all that God wants you to be or to be spiritually mature. Okay, this is what Paul wants for them. This is what we ought to want for one another. That we be all that God wants us to be. That we be like just completely flowers just opening up and blooming as the Spirit is just transforming us into Christ-likeness. That we might be all that God wants us to be. And Carson continues, he says, we may think we're peculiarly mature Christians because of our theology, our education, our years of experience, our traditions, but Paul knows better. He knows we cannot be as mature as we ought to be until we know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that interesting how Paul does that? He sits here and he says, know the link with height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that... We wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily tie those things together. But this comprehension of Christ's love is tied very tightly to our being the people that God wants us to be. And so Paul is praying that for them. He wants this maturity in their lives. See, the church in principle already is the fullness of Christ. You see it in chapter 1, verse 23, Colossians 2.10. But in practice, it has not yet attained the fullness Okay, you see again this tension, the already and the not yet. He says, you're the fullness of Christ. Here he's praying for the fullness of Christ. Okay, Andrew Lincoln says in his commentary, the relationship between what, what the church is and what the church is to become reflects ultimately the tension between the already and the not yet. Or as O'Brien puts it more succinctly, they are to become what they already are. You go, what? <laughs> what? But you see the idea. You see, you see the idea that it is invaded, that is it. They say we are to become what is already ours in right, in principle. We are to live up to what God has bestowed on us. All right, here's this doxology. Chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Paul says, now to him who is able 
to do immeasurably beyond all things that we ask or imagine, according to the power that is working in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now, having, having boldly petitioned God on their behalf, right? I mean, what he's just been praying for, all of this transforming work, this repositioning, God giving them this greater comprehension so that they might be all that God wants them to be. Paul then says this, you see, he's petitioned God, and having done that, he then praises God as the one who can do immeasurably beyond all the things we ask or imagine. His power is limitless. Right? His power is limitless. That's who God is. And so Paul, having asked such great things, he praises God for that. And the power by which he can do all things is in accordance with, is in conformity with, the power that is at work within us, within Christians, through the Spirit. Do you see how we have the power within us to be transformed? You know, the, the song, you know, uh, free me from its guilt and power, be of sin the double, you know, be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power, free me from its guilt and power. It's guilt, that's where we stop. We so often just say, well, you know, all, all it is, is it's purely forensic. Just go ahead and I'm forgiven, that's it. From its guilt and power. <laughs> Do you see the power that is at work to transform us? And if we sit here and fight it and resist it and won't yield to it, and then turn around and say, well, you know, there's no power in there. Don't blame the power. Don't blame the power. There is power to take the lowest, worst sinner and turn him into somebody that you sit here and say, what a, what a just righteous person. You know, what a, how has this person changed? He used to be involved in all of this, trapped, enslaved. But the power of God in his life has freed him from that. Okay, we have to see that. We have to see it as an important part of the gospel of Christ. Is he doesn't save us and leave us. Where I just say, don't worry about it. You've been forgiven. Just continue living in that. Uh -uh. Power to transform us. That power that can do immeasurably beyond all we ask or imagine, is in accordance with the power that is at work within us. Okay, so we can be different. Now Paul ascribes glory to God in the church. Of course, and in Christ Jesus. But I want to pause on glory to God in the church. Because again, this attitude that's in our culture, that the church is somehow dispensable, the church is a drag, the church is, you know, this, this burdensome thing. Well, somebody needs to get their mind right about what the church is, right? And look what F.F. Bruce says. He says, God is to be glorified in the church because the church comprising Jews and Gentiles, and of course all other healed hostilities, all other you know, chasms that exist between human beings, whether they be class, you know, I'm highborn, you're a lowlife, you see? Whether it be, you know, I'm, I'm, of the, you know, I'm a plutocrat and you're a dirtbag. Okay, so, you, I mean, all of these things. But here he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. But he says, is his, God, God is to be glorified in the church because the church comprising Jews and Gentiles is his masterpiece of grace. It is through the church that his wisdom is made known to the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know that, right? We all say that the heavens declare the glory of God, but even greater glory is shown by his handiwork in the community of reconciliation. Do you ever think of the church that way? You look out and you go, wow, it's so awe-inspiring. As I look around and see the heavens, his handiwork, I look and see the intricate details of the cell. I see all of it. Do you ever think of the church as proclaiming the glory of God in this body of reconciled people who once were at each other's throat, who were hostile, that the reconciling work of Christ has brought them together. That is to the glory of God. The church's existence is to the glory of God. And, and Paul is saying that, and we need to hear it, and we need to understand it. That the church is not something you brush off your feet. The church is to the glory of God. 
And he says, the heavens declare the glory of God, but even greater joy is shown by his handiwork in the community of reconciliation. This community, moreover, consists of human beings who are united in Christ, members of his body in whom Christ dwells. The glory of God in the church cannot be divorced from his glory in Christ Jesus. Of course, see, the church is reconciled in Christ Jesus. But you have to see this. You have to see what he speaks of here. Now, this glory will have no end. All right, throughout all generations, forever and ever, the redeemed in Christ will bear witness to the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Eternally, we will bear witness to the grace and the mercy of God by our existence. Okay, this group of redeemed sinners, our existence by God's mercy expresses to everything for all time, the greatness and the glory of our God and Father in Jesus Christ. And then the amen is something that would be said or echoed by the congregation as their endorsement of the doxology when that letter was read out loud. So when he, when he said that, he was looking for the people would say, that's right. Okay? They would say, that's right. That is our God. You see, that is our God. All right, chapter 4. We're gonna have a, there's a, a big shift here. All right, these first three chapters that we've been looking at, you see this, these great doctrinal themes are sounded. Okay, I hope I've done some justice to that because they're amazing what Paul spells out in these first three chapters. These great doctrinal themes have been sounded, but Paul, see, he exhorts them in chapters 4 through 6 on the basis of these great doctrinal themes that he's presented. He then in chapters 4 through 6, he exhorts them to live a certain way. Okay, the division isn't airtight, but there's definitely a shift in chapter 4, verse 1, from theology to ethical admonition, from explaining what is theirs in Christ to urging them to live consistently with that mighty salvation. Okay, so he'd been telling them, listen, this is what God has done for you. Look what you have in Christ. Look where you were. He has taken you, reconciled you, brought you into one body, reconciled you with God. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Now we're going to get to chapter 40. He's going to say, therefore, therefore, you got some stuff to do. You need to live a certain way. And I was telling somebody last night, when you talk that way, and I say it in here all the time, People say, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to talk too much about righteousness and holiness and sin and calling people to live rightly. I don't, because if you do that, then it sounds like you're making work salvation. I can put the two together. I can understand that my standing before God is by grace, through faith, not by works. And I can also understand that because of what he's done, he calls me to live a holy life. Okay, so you call me to live a holy life, and I call you to live a holy life, unapologetically. I don't sit here and go, well, you know, you really shouldn't be committing adultery. You really shouldn't be doing that. You know, you really shouldn't be engaging in homosexual activity. Uh, no! I'm going to tell you the truth about it. Right? Tell you the truth about it. And you're going to see Paul is not slow in telling the truth. None of the Bible writers, that's why I never understand that idea. When people say that to me, I think, have you read the Bible? Have you seen what is said in the Bible? I mean, in chapter 4, here, we'll, we'll start. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you, therefore, to walk worthily of the calling to which you were called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called to one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who was over all and through all and in all. Okay, we have Paul's exhortation here. He's going to exhort them to walk worthily of the calling they've received. And he undergirds that by the fact of his own costly commitment to Christ. Where is he writing from? He's a prisoner. Paul says, look, this isn't, this Christian your devotion to Christ, your life for Christ, it is not some game. This isn't the Rotary Club. This is a revolution. You give your life to this. You, know, you go down and talk to some revolutionary somewhere. I've said this before. But you go down somewhere where you got people who are engaged in a revolution. What do they do? They eat, sleep, and breathe it. It consumes them. 
And what are they doing? They're talking about overthrowing some worldly government. But it is their commitment and devotion to it. Well, Paul writes as a prisoner. Why is it? Because it's a yawner. You say, well, you know, I, didn't really, I wasn't really serious about this Christ stuff. You know, it's kind of a neat philosophy. You can kind of throw it in a little bit. No. This call of Christ, this is a world-changing, radical thing. And so Paul undergirds his call that, listen, you're going to need to really live up to this calling. People are going, well, that's easy for you to say. No, it's not easy for me to say. I'm writing to you from prison. So don't give me that. I know what it means to sacrifice for the cause of Christ. I know what it means to live for him. And I'm calling you to do the same. Okay? N none of this stuff about, hey, we got, the, well, we got the people who really live for Christ, and then we just live down here for ourselves. Is that the way the body of Christ is? No. All of us were called to live righteously. He urges them to live worthily of the blessed state to which they've been called in Christ, now, specifically, see, he urges them to, main, to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which involves conducting themselves with all humility and gentleness, with patience, and bearing with one another in love. See, Christ has effected peace between warring groups of people. Christ has done this. He has effected peace between the formerly hostile Jews and Gentiles, and by implication, he's done that with regard to all other hostilities. He has achieved this. He has affected this peace. He put to death their hostility and formed them into one new body. That's what he's been saying all through chapters 1, 2, and 3. Christ has accomplished this, right? He put to death their hostilities. He formed them into one new body whose various parts share the same spirit the one spirit in whom they have access to the Father, as he says in chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. See, that unity is a spiritual fact. It is something that Christ did, and then Paul ex he exhorts them not to create that unity. He exhorts them to maintain it. Okay, to maintain it. Gordon Fee writes, he says, the unity of the spirit, this is in his book, God's Empowering Presence. He says, the unity of the spirit does not refer to some sentimental or esoteric unity that believers should work toward. Rather, Paul is speaking of something that exists prior to the exhortation. Whether they like it or not, their lavish experience of the Spirit, which they have in common with all others who belong to Christ, has made them members of the one body of Christ, both on the larger scale and its more immediate expression in the local community and in their believing households. So they may as well get on with liking it, and demonstrate as much by the way they live. Okay, we are spiritually one. And we are called to express and reflect that oneness that Christ has created. We are not to mar it. We are to maintain it. And it's very important, see, they're to maintain, they are to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the unity Christ affected in the form of the bond of peace meaning they're to express that unity by living at peace with one another. This is what he's saying to them. You are to live, and Christ has made you one. You are to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. He means you are to live at peace with one another. Does that resonate? Does that say anything to churches that we are to live at peace with one another? Does it say anything to factions that develop in all groups? I'm going to talk over here. BG. You see these people? I don't like jockey. Ah. And what do we do? A little subset, you see, a little pocket, a little irritation. Okay, is that maintaining this? I don't think so. Okay, this ought to resonate because it's an important thing. And Paul is saying he's putting this idea of living at peace with one another in such a higher theological context. You see, not well. We ought to do it because the Lord says so. Yes, he says so. But do you understand how this functions? What this is? Okay, they're to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Uh, they're to express that unity by living at peace with one another. The qualities that are essential to the goal of living at peace with one another, to maintaining the unity of the Spirit, those qualities in include humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, do you understand how those qualities, those particular things that they facilitate peace. I hope you can see that. 
how humility, gentleness, and patience, those qualities breed peace. Arrogance breeds division. What are you talking to me? Huh? What do you mean? You talking to me? What's that? Do you, you see that? I mean, that that's, the, that's division. Humility. Where he sits there and says, listen, well, what, are you, what are you thinking? What are you saying? You see? All right, so he, he tells him here that include humility, gentleness, and, and patience. These qualities facilitate peace, and they're part of what's necessary to bear with one another in love. And bearing with one another's weaknesses and failures out of love for each other is the essence of living at peace with one another. How do you think you live at peace with one another if you can't bear with one another's weaknesses and failures? You're going to have to jump to another planet because you're living with people like me. Okay? So you're going to have to bear with it. Weaknesses, frailties, all of that. That is what it means. That's the essence of living at peace with one another. We have to see it. We have to do it. God is calling us to do it. We're to live at peace with one another. We can sit here and harbor things, you know, for years and years. And I sit here, does this not sink in? Does this not work? I mean, you know, I feel like, what about this? Don't you understand? I understand the bell. Thank you. 